Hello and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in crop sciences in the Department of ACES. So I'll handle cut flower questions or maybe perennials, but there are three talented folks here with me who also have a wide array of expertise. And so you might gear any questions or you know interests towards a specific interest here at the table. So I'm gonna start and throw it over first to Dr. Bob Skirvin. Hello, I'm glad to be here again. My name is Bob Skirvin, and, my, and I, I taught for many years at the University of Illinois in horticulture, and I'm uh, retired now, but I still wander around looking at plants. And my, my specialty is uh, fruit crops, and I did a lot, a lot of work with gra grapes and wine and strawberries and so forth. So t anyway, but every time I'm on the show, if you don't know it, I, I, get, <laughs> I love to go to the grocery store, and I go there regularly, and see what, and I like to come back and report what's in season, and it's time to get, get out and look and take a try, so you get the best quality you can. And right now, the strawberries are starting to come in. Now, there have been strawberries earlier, and the strawberries from Mexico, and the, they, they really, they've, been, they've been pretty good, but the good ones are starting to come in now. And the best ones will come from California, and they should be coming in within days. But, uh, but they're, right, right now, these are from Florida. And when you go to the store, first of all, the, the way to pick strawberries at, at the store is to take and pick up these clam packs, they call, that's what they call it, they're real nice, so they don't get crushed, everything. and smell them. You don't have to open the package. I've seen people do that, and that's kind of, they get, you know, kind of disgusting. But you can stick your nose here at the side, and if it smells like strawberries, you want to buy that one. And believe me, they'll, in the store, they'll have 50 of these things laid out there, and some of them are going to be better than others. And so you just take and pick and smell them. Pick the one that smells best to you and take and buy that. And then, and then when you buy it, you take it open the clam pack and try to get the clam pack. And I haven't tried these yet. Anyway, the strawberry look good. There we go. The way I eat them, I eat cap at all. Everyone's going, ooh, ah. Oh, uh. good. good one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, these are really good. Now, supposedly, the caps are back here. Some people, I used to tell my students all the time, they always eat the cap. There's, some, there's a compound called lactic acid that actually inhibits the growth of, of certain cancers, hormone-induced cancers. And so when you eat the cap up here, you're actually giving yourself a boost of anti-cancer activity. Plus, it, it'll upset your parents, upset your grandma. <laughs> <laughs> They'll think you're crazy when you start eating the cap. So you, you be sure to eat a cap, eat the strawberry. Oh, he's going to have another one. Look at him. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good. <laughs> well, good. Thank you, Bob, very mm. much. And now everyone wants to go get strawberries. All right, let's go next to you, Kelly Alsip. Um, yes, my name is Kelly Alsip, and I teach horticulture for University of Illinois Extension. And um, my expertise would be house plants or tropicals. I love talking about all flowers and all insects, though. Um, what I brought for show and tell today was is a staghorn fern, and. It is a really cool house plant because it's an epiphyte, which means it doesn't have true roots, but rather gets its water and mineral nutrients from the air or the rain. Or in nature, it would grow in the crotch of a tree and it might get some of its nutrients um, from the organic matter, which is all the dead stuff. But it has two different kinds of leaves. It has a sterile leaf at the base, which is brown and kind of cool. Um, uh, and then it has these fertile leaves up here, these green ones that are kind of, they kind of look like a staghorn, right, Diane? Mm -hmm, they do. And um, so it's in a basket full of moss. So uh, what I love about <coughs> epiphytes is what makes them an epiphyte. I don't have to have a pot of soil to grow this so I can hang it on my wall. And I do have a hanger right here, so it kind of like just, you know, it makes my apart my uh, house look so much better when I have plants growing on the wall. Looks like artwork. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Do you have to water it? Yes, uh, oh. you know, you water <laughs> it, um, you know, you let it dry down a, a lot, you water it, I always put it in my sink and spritz it down. Um, and you would think that uh, I wouldn't have to water it quite so much now, but I don't have a lot of humidity in my mm -hmm. house for some reason. And so I have to water it a lot, uh, you know, at least once or twice a week and I just soak it down. 
Um, in, the, in the summer, uh, I'm going to take it outside into a shady location and maybe fertilize it a little bit once a month. But I have seen these grow gigantic in greenhouses mm -hmm. and botanical gardens. And uh, just really a beautiful, interesting house plant. So it's not only a plant, it's living art. It's a conversation piece. It's really pretty and so unique. Do you, do you, if you wanted to propagate it, you take, just pull it apart? Do you cut it apart? Yeah, or? actually, uh, <laughs> Diane saw me earlier. I accidentally broke a piece off, and I have a piece in the dressing room if you want it later. So and you, it will propagate yeah. itself. With, with a piece of root? Or? It's not a piece of root. It's a sort of a plantlet, a piece of the leaf, mm -hmm. a growing mm -hmm. point. Huh. It's always the first question horticulturists ask. Can I, <laughs> how, how, how can I get this plant to gr make another one? So good mm -hmm. question. And thank you for bringing that. It looks thank really you. great. All right, now let's go to you, Jim Schuster. Okay, <clears throat> I'm Jim Schuster. I'm a retired horticulturist and plant pathologist from the University of Illinois Extension System. And my first question is, what is it? It is very slimy. <laughs> uh, and have no idea where this one came from or, you know, basically it's, with the green grass, it was taken in the summer of last year, but uh, what you're looking at is one of the many, many, or actually several hundred wood rots. Uh, that says that tree is rotting very well. Uh, based on the amount of pruning bodies, uh, I would say that tree is probably half rotten through the center of it. Uh, and these are called shelf fungi because they look like they're shells sticking out from the trunk. There are two kinds. Uh, the one is a conch, that's hard and it actually produces growth rings for every year that's growing out the side of the tree. The other one is just a shelf fungi and they tend to be full of water and if you crush them, they <coughs> are the slimy one. Uh, you can take them all off and <coughs> you'll have them regrow by the end of the summer uh, if you did that in the spring. By the end of the summer, they be back the same size that you're uh, having. Mm -hmm. I once took one off a tree that was three-fourths of a way around on American elm. Uh, that was literally wow. five feet wide, long in a circle and about yay deep. And mm -hmm. I dried it and dried it and dried it. And when it got done, it was <laughs> this big. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> because it was 90% water. Uh, but wow. basically, uh, there's nothing you can do about that except remove the tree because with that much wood rot, it's becoming it's very unsafe. Good point. So that's an indicator of when you mm -hmm. should be removing a tree. Right. Good, thank you. Not good that she has to remove a tree, but good that you answered the question so interestingly, so that's great. Now let's go to our segment called, Did You Know? Bamboo is the fastest growing woody plant in the world. It can grow 35 inches in a single day. Does that make anyone nervous? Yeah. I would think you wanna make sure if you have that type of a bamboo that you really want it because your neighbors may have it as well if you're not careful. All right, let's go to the phone lines and we're gonna start first with Mary Sue's uh, call. It's about an amaryllis on line two. Hi there, Mary Sue. Hi, thank you and I really love your program. Thank you. And I've been listening to it for years and I've been asking questions and messing with my garden and my pots for years, but this is about my amaryllis. I have two originals from Christmas of 1991. Wow. And they have bloomed on and off, and all of a sudden, in the last year or two or three, I'm not getting any blooms at all or any blooms. But here's my question. I'm looking, I have, out of the five pots that I have, and of course two of them are already trying to make another baby, and eventually I take the babies away and put them in another pot. But, um, I have three that each of them has one or two, one, one huge leaf still in them. And because they hadn't bloomed as much, I thought I would leave them up here in my sunny kitchen and just water them sparingly until they used up the energy in the leaf. But I can't, I, I'm, it's time to take them down to the basement as far as I'm concerned, but I hate to kill off that one leaf that each one of them has. Well. I am so glad you're here today, Kelly, because <clears throat> I'm. She's a professional on amaryllis from when she did lots of greenhouse growing. Well, definitely one of the things we did in the greenhouses, and I don't know if you do, is we always dry down the pots during the summer, 
and we pull them out in uh, the late summer so we can have them blooming by um, Christmas time. And we did, you know, water and fertilize them well. But as far as taking apart the bulbs, um, you know, I wouldn't throw away a bulb with a leaf on it. Mm -hmm. Did I get that correct? Or she, you know, drying it down. I would definitely uh, pot it up and grow it like a normal plant, a normal house plant for a year, and then go ahead and next yeah. year, with all the other amaryllis bulbs, put it back down into uh, the, 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 the drying period for the summer. So, you know, you know, during the fall, it's putting on its flower bulb, it's putting on its flower bud and flowering, then it um, puts out leaves and you grow it like a house plant for the rest of the summer. And then at the end of the summer, you put, you put it, middle of summer, you put it, you dry it down and then you pull it out about 10 weeks before Christmas, I think it's what Diane used to have me do in the greenhouse. Because <laughs> we always like to cut the flowers. Yeah, then. cut the flowers for Christmas time. So, um, and I would yeah. definitely think about drying it down. Um, that can, that initiates flowering and pot up whatever you have. Okay, so boy, Mary Sue, you are doing something right though. If you've had some amaryllis since 1991, so try growing that one like a foliage plant for a little bit. Okay, more phone lines. We do have some more lines open, so if you want to call in, but let's go to Linda's question next on line three, and it's about the lawn or grass. Linda, what's your question? Hi, thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. I had a blue, a large, very large blue spruce removed this year it it died and i'm wondering how i need to um, work the ground again to get grass or other plants to grow there okay go well, for it i would uh when the ground is thawed enough i mean i'm not sure if it's frozen or not but if it is frozen wait till it thaws and then uh pitchfork it or uh trowel it or hoe it and get it uh broken up into real fine particles and you can do that as long as it's not wet. I mean, it can be moist, but not wet. Otherwise, you'll make brick of it. Uh, and then put grass seed down. Uh, preferably a high-quality grass seed, uh, because if you buy cheap stuff, you're going to get some of the weed grasses also, like quack grass and tall fescue and any of the pasture grasses. Uh, so look at your seed label and make sure you're buying a pretty decent quality. And you want it to blend three or more varieties of bluegrass uh, because that way um, you tend to have a nicer lawn all from spring to fall. And by the way, you can put the grass seed down. If you get it, uh, the soil ready, let's say yeah, by the end of this month, February, uh, or early March, you can put the grass seed down now, even if it refreezes or snows on it, and it will g basically germinate and start growing as it warms up and be up and growing <coughs> before most of the weeds are, which will help you get a nice, dense turf. And that's the trick, before right. the weeds are. Right. Wow, good tips. So if you can work it up, you can plant it. So let's go on. And Betty has a question on line four for us about gourds. Hi, Betty. Yes, I, I tried to grow a bush of gourd last year, but wasn't real successful. And partly I think is because the direction said that I was supposed to nip the seed before I planted it. Now. What do you do? How do you do that? I tried cutting it horizontally and vertically, and this, this still didn't work very well. Yeah, well, the I, I can tell you that one. Uh, the seeds, the p pumpkin seeds and all these gourd seeds are kind of pointed. And, and the embryo, the part that's going to grow into the plant, is at the pointy end. And so and, uh, what, what happens, you want to get them to germinate a lot of, a lot of plants is the seed coat is so hard that water can't get in, oxygen can't get in, and so you need to nip it to get it going. And the, the way you can do it, especially in small quantities like this, is at the fat end of the seed. So at the pointy end is down here, and you don't want to hurt that, but up here, just take a, t take a knife or take a little pair of uh, cutter clippers of some sort and just cut a little bit off the top. That'll get water inside, it'll go. But, do, but stay away from the pointy end, otherwise you'll kill the seed. Bob, do you think they could take individual seeds on the fat end and rub it on sandpaper oh, and scratch right. it? And that's a, a, another way to do it, especially if it's big enough you can hold it in your fingers, you can take it do, do on the fat end, remember the fat end, up there, do it that way. 
Yeah, I've used sandpaper and I've used a file. Mm -hmm. I've even, for nasturtiums, I take and have two pieces of sandpaper. <laughs> <laughs> but you wouldn't want to do that for these because no, yeah. you want to get the one in. Yeah, but when you yeah. need to get rid of that seed coat, it's so much easier than individually. But good tip because I really had not ever done that for gourds. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, yeah. I wasn't aware. I guess they germinated for me <laughs> or I you planted, planted enough of them I planted pl <laughs> that's what I was gonna say I must have planted more than I needed well that was a good question thank you Betty I've learned something here all right let's go on to line five and Beverly has a question about house plants hi Beverly hi um, I was wondering when you repot house plants um, or you're planting flowers and pots for outside is it okay to use clean coffee filters to cover the drainage hole in the bottom of the pot or, or what is the best thing to do to cover that drainage hole? I use used ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, and we can talk about other things too, but I use used paper. Yeah. Yeah. I'm taking little uh, rocks. Yes, and I've used that. As long as they don't form a good seal, but yeah. And just, Broken clay pot mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. fragments. Yeah, in, the, in the greenhouse, they buy these huge coffee filters, that just mm -hmm. boxes and boxes of them that they put at the bottom of the big pots. And so yes, coffee filters are good, but I use the used ones. I don't. <laughs> I don't want to use the unused ones. And it's really once the the plants use up that soil, you don't have to worry about soil brushing out. And so when I do my, when I pot up mine. 14 inch planters in the spring, I'm only watering those a little bit every time until they really start spreading their roots out. And so maybe you're watering it a little bit too much in the beginning if you're having a lot of that that's soil a, drain that's out. That's a good point. But anyway, that's a good start of thinking that, but some people use fabrics that are, you know, yeah. real light fabrics that they're not gonna use. I mean, there's- the Coffee filters break down fast. Yeah, so there's lots of things to use as long as it lets water through. Okay, well thank you for asking that question. And we're gonna go on to line two and William's question. It's about Iris. Hi, William. Oh, I heard yeah. a, oh, William, are you there? Yeah. What's your oh, question? What I know is I've, I've got Iris. I've had them planted for about oh, 11, 12 years. I've transplanted them and they turn green, they grow, but I can't give them the flower. When do you transplant them? Well, at the end of the year, uh, June, July. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say, that's a good time to yeah. transplant them. Yeah. How, yeah. Do you space them fairly far apart? Uh, well, you know, five, six inches. Well, that well, there's one possibility. Okay. If they're getting iris borer, it will drain mm -hmm. the tuber so much that there's not enough energy to flower, just barely enough to grow leaves. So check for iris borer. Uh, that would be the main one. I, when my and iris don't bloom, I've got borer in them. And you can tell because the rhizome will be softer mm -hmm. or completely destroyed, but yeah. soft. Yeah. Uh, make sure you give it plenty of sun. Um, I wouldn't transplant it very often once you get them started and give them space. And not in a wet area. And you got, right. You gotta have really good drainage. So and try to find a higher spot. And, and make sure the top half of the iris tuber is sticking out of the ground when you're done planting. I thought of that. It may have been planted too deep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these are lots of questions because otherwise you should have lots and lots of really good iris. Okay. Well, thank you, William, for your question. And now we're gonna go back to some uh, email questions. Bob, let's start with you. Okay. Well, the, the one, I'll get those out of the way here. We'll eat them pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> the good, the good strawberries. Anyway, uh, they got a question here about raspberries. And the question is, is on the raspberries, have I cut my red raspberries to the ground now? Will I get, get fruit this spring or fall, or does it take a year? Now, in the case of uh, raspberries, one of the things is that there are two kinds of raspberries, and the old-fashioned kind you don't hardly see anymore. But the one that is a, is a fall bearing raspberry, and the fall bearing raspberry produces most of its berries in the fall. And we've always preferred that because it, it, the ones that's the spring bearing type, if you take a reason, it starts getting pretty hot and it loses flavor, and the, and the raspberries are harder to pick, and your customers don't want to come pick them because it's so hot. And the fall ones is, is cooler, and the volatile stay in, and the raspberries taste better, and they're easy to go. And so some of the fall, fall bearing ones, 
is a commercial production is they actually cut the, this, this time of the year, you go through and cut the whole thing to the ground. You can do that too, if you have the right kind. They cut it to the ground, then the new growth comes up. The new growth that does, produces no spring crop, so you don't have a crop in the springtime. But those shoots, when they come up, <coughs> will have produce a crop in the fall. And so, it's a, it, so in terms of production, it's really easy. You don't have to prune them because they didn't grow up. And, you, you, and uh, for training them, because they, some of the varieties tend to flop like this, is if you take a big piece of twine, just take it, wrap it around your, your plant and then kind of tug up. It'll, cinch it'll, it'll, it up. <laughs> cinch yeah. it up, yeah. And they kind of stand up, and then you don't have to even tie them up at all. And so, or mm. you take and prune them up like the old-fashioned kind. You have to put them on a trellis. And it works out real well. But uh, what, when you buy raspberries, make sure that you buy these fall bearing type. And almost all of them anymore are fall bearing because they're so convenient. Okay. I've learned a few things there about raspberry too. And I do have some and I love them. Thank you, Bob. And now Kelly. Okay, thank you. Uh, I actually have never seen a person eat an entire strawberry before. Oh, and I uh, oh. look forward to trying it after the show. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got a question about uh, hummingbirds and bees taking up nectar and does the uh, nectar then replenish itself? And actually, yes, nectar does replenish itself as it is used. Um, and the reason it keeps replenishing itself is because pollen is released slowly and a little bit at a time. And the amount of nectar in a flower uh, really depends on what that flower is being pollinated by. For instance, if a hummingbird were to pollinate your flower, that flower may um, produce a little bit more nectar and it might be a little bit more diluted than a flower that is visited by a bee. And uh, I actually found a study online that uh, was uh, researching uh, penstemons. Hmm. And they said that they tracked 100 visits to a penstemon flower in wow. one day by bumblebees. So uh, That's yeah, unbelievable. it's replenishing its nectar. And that is valuable um, energy that the plant is using in producing this nectar. Wow, well thank you, that was very interesting. All right, Jim, you're next. Okay, <clears throat> I have a question on uh, both evergreen and deciduous azaleas that have spots on the leaves. And I actually went and looked this one up because um, I wasn't sure which leaf spots they get. And I was shocked by how many they do get, uh, both fungal uh, diseases and bacterial diseases. This is not an insect, which is what the person thought it was. There are. Um, the, this damage that uh, you're seeing on the picture is not caused by an insect. These are um, disease spots. The problem is I don't know if they're bacterial or fungal, and if it is a fungal one, which one it is. So I'm going to suggest find a fungicide that says it controls leaf spots, and if it works, then they were fungal leaf spots. If it doesn't work, you have bacterial leaf spots, and you're kind of stuck. Okay, wow, that was thorough, but, sh but brief too, yeah. so that's good. Well, we're going to try to answer a gooseberry question in a short period of time here at the end. Let's go to Doug's question on line one about gooseberry. Hi, Doug. Hi, uh, thank you for taking my call. You're welcome. Last year, I pruned my gooseberry bush at the end of February and did not get any fruit uh, in 2016. And I'm curious, what did I do wrong? I thought that was the time to prune it. Yeah, well, the, the, the gooseberries, the way they flower and fruit is on the, on the older, older part of the not too old stems. And so if you have a gooseberry bush, what happens, the way, the way we recommend pruning them is that if you have a, an older plant, especially if you have 15, 20 stems down here at the ground, is you take and, uh, and choose uh, one that's like, seven years old, one six years old, one five years old, one four years old, leave, leave some of these, even, even maybe two of each of that age like that. And then you take and prune off some of the new growth down to the little spurs. So they have, they have ax axillary buds at the base and take and prune it down to that and the new, then the flowers come, come from that. 
Now, I, have, I don't have a lot of experience with gooseberries because I don't like the thorns and I don't much like gooseberries. <laughs> but other than that. But he would thin it yeah. and not and thin it. And then, then the next year when you prune it, is you take, basically take out the oldest cane and throw that one away and you, then you kind of keep, keep the plant rejuvenated okay. as you go in there. Well, that was pretty good for not liking gooseberries. You knew the answer, <laughs> so that's great. But I wanted to answer it while we had our fruit specialist here on the show. Well, thank you, folks, for being here and all your good questions and an answers to the questions. And, and uh, really, we had some good questions this mm -hmm. evening, too, from mm -hmm. our viewers. So we want to say thank you to our viewers. We love having you ask, ask your questions. Well, we know it's still maybe a little wintry, but get out there and do some gardening and do some indoor gardening, too. And we'll see you next time. Goodbye. Nice and strong.